My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast. Welcome back, everyone. It's so great to have you here. Had a great time recording the uh, episode zero that introduces like who I am, what I'm about. And for those of you who didn't listen, I'll go ahead and tell you, like I said before, I'm Christian Ashley. I'm a seminary student at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, I have been a Christian since I was six years old. I've been raised in the church. I have lovely family who helped bring me to Christ. I am really looking forward to what else we're going to be doing here. For those of you who don't know, didn't listen to episodes of you again, we will be starting with the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to be doing the entire chapter of Luke 1 today. And some people would call me a madman, but that's fine. It's only 80 verses. We can get through this so easily. So why don't we just go ahead, get started, and we're going to go from verses 1 to 4 at the very beginning here. Inasmuch as many have undertaken... Oh, sorry. I should also say, my bad. <laughs> this is why I need to rehearse this more. Uh, we will be reading from the ESV primarily from this. I think... There's one other verse I'll be reading. I think that'll be from the NKJV. So let's start over. Uh, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So we have a couple of things to unpack from these first four verses. This story is being told to us by Luke the Evangelist, Luke who would join with Paul, later on write the book of Acts. And how does he start this story? By letting us know that we can trust it. Now, You'll know, have some people out there say, well, of course a con man would say something like that. They want you to trust them. Or if you're trying to tell the truth, what do you have to do? You have to set up why you're trustworthy in the first place. And what Luke chooses to do here is use other people, eyewitnesses, as primary sources. Luke, unfortunately, is at best a secondary and at worst a tertiary source for the story of Jesus. But by talking with the people who have met him, who have, you know, uh, some would even say that who gave birth to him would be a primary source Luke uses. We'll get to that in a moment. By doing all that, Luke is able to help set up his witness for who Christ is, what his story is, and why we should trust it. And I am so grateful for that. And it's one of the reasons why I love Luke as much as I do as a writer, as a historian, and that he makes sure he gets his facts right. And as someone who is terrified of ever getting anything wrong, because I don't want to spread misinformation, because there's plenty of it now, I love people who do this. So Luke starts us all off with this. And what is his main source other than potentially Mary? We'll get to that. Well, it is believed at this point in time that Luke may have used the Gospel of Mark as a reference for some of what he's saying, everything on right there. And Mark, obviously being the shortest gospel, is probably the gospel that was written first. And depending on who you ask, most non-Christian scholars would say all the gospels were written sometime after 70 AD. Now, I have my own personal conspiracy theory for that, but you'll have to wait till we eventually get to uh, the discussion revolving around the temple. So that'll be a ways off. But also, Luke may have had what is known as the Q document. Now, there's some debate on what this is. It is believed there are no surviving uh, reports of this uh, Q document from what I can recall from my study on this matter. But it's a potential maybe fifth gospel or just a collection of stories that may not be scripture, but are true nonetheless, of just someone writing it down. So, kind of hard to speculate on that, but I believe Luke was written, as some other scholars do, uh, about in the late 60s AD. Uh, I believe Paul was still alive at this time. And see, what, The reason I think that is because in Acts, it does not discuss the death of Paul, and this story is told before the book of Acts. And that's kind of an important thing, so you would think Luke, being a good friend of Paul, would put that in there, but that's beyond the point. I'm not a scholar. 
I can't definitively say. Neither, neither can anyone, really, because we weren't there. But that's it for that. So moving on, for everyone who doesn't know, I don't want to assume everyone listening to this is a Christian. So I'm going to put as much information as I can for everyone just coming in. One thing you may or may not know is that Luke is not Jewish. Luke is a Gentile convert uh, from across the Mediterranean who came to faith and is the only Gentile writer of Scripture to the point that uh, just under 28% of the entire New Testament, Luke and Acts, was written by a Gentile. And that's amazing, because this is just part of the message we later get across, is this is not just for the Jewish people. This is for everyone, and Luke is an amazing testament to that. I mean, no pun intended. So that's just a wonderful thing we can learn here. And so who is this mysterious Theophilus that he's talking to? Well, short answer is, uh, I. (laughs) Uh, Scholars really don't know. There have been some speculation. It's some higher member in Rome's court uh, who wouldn't be very happy with, or he was trying to look out for his family, maybe, if he was ever found out as a Christian. So Luke wrote it to him secretly, gave him the secret name, which means friend of God. That is not his real name, just we use it as a code name to protect him. There's some debate. No one knows, but it's fun to speculate. So, you know, why not? So we'll move on to there to verse five. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, and I'm sorry, this is one of the things I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sometimes mid-verse, sometimes only after a couple So if that bothers you, I apologize, but it's just how I roll. Who the heck is Herod? Herod the Great was a half-Jewish, half-Nabataean man who claimed descent more than likely also from the Edomites, who, if you'll remember, for those of you who've read your Genesis, are the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. So you get the Edomites from Edom, excuse me, from Esau, you get the Israelites from Jacob, so they are both family in that regard. Now, there's some debate on whether or not he's actually a descendant of the Edomites. The Nabataeans were an Arabic group who took over the region where Edom once was. So I say all this to say, like, he is not popular for his mixed heritage, and that's just one of the things you'll see throughout the Gospels is this uh, very big racial tension in the area. I mean, and we can't gloss over that. Even though people did like Herod, one of the reasons some of them didn't was because of his race. But we don't use that as an excuse for why he did what he did. It's not the reason Herod was such a cruel and terrible man, an awful leader who will do what he does eventually, as we see in Matthew with the murder of the innocents. But people have used this as a way to say, oh, that's why he did what he did. That's why he's such a terrible person. I want to speak out against that. That has no place in the gospel of Christ. This idea of any race being inferior or superior to one another. So if that's something that you're wrestling with in your heart, I would encourage you, my friends, to meet other people from many different backgrounds. One of the things I am blessed with right now in seminary, I was not prepared for, which I am so happy that it is a reality now, was just how many people from so many different parts of the globe are here. And it's amazing. I have friends with people from Nigeria, from Papua New Guinea, uh, from, let's see, uh, Russia, and all over the place. And like, I've never been to these countries, but I've met the people in them, this small snippet of what could be there. And it has opened my eyes to just how great and wonderful this world that God has made is. So... That's it for that. So Herod, moving on, is a very unpopular figure all over Scripture. I mean, definitely from your Christian side and even from your Jewish side, no one really likes him. Uh, He was barely liked at times by Rome, but he did an effective job at leadership, and that's why he kept his job as long as he did. So that's all in mind there. We'll move on to the rest of verse 5. There was a priest named Zechariah, and some of your Bibles may say Zacharias, which is the Greek form of Zechariah, of the division of Abijah. 
And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So, we see right here a a viewpoint of two wonderful people who had lived their entire lives devoted to God, to worshiping Him, to the point where they are seen as righteous before him walking blamelessly does that actually mean that they had committed no sin no that's not what it means it's like the idea being expressed through these words is that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing and it's not that they never sinned but compared to their righteousness their sins were next to nothing but as we all know that's not enough to get them into heaven And we'll see how they react in different ways to what's going on. And what we also see here is a classic narrative trope in the Bible, and that is the issue of barrenness in a family. It's a very uncomfortable subject. I know there are many people out there who are struggling with it who think that because it's happening to them, they're less than, that God doesn't love them, or he thinks they think they might be punishing them for something. But as we see throughout Scripture, it may be as a result of God waiting for his time to be done. Or it may be that no child will ever be produced, and a couple may seek out adoption, or no children whatsoever. We don't know, but we can't assign blame for something we have no spiritual context for. So if that's happening for you out there, like know, know that you're being prayed for, and know that you are loved, and that there is nothing wrong with you. You are not less than. But what we see here is that both of them, they are from two uh, families in this regard. There's uh, divisions of the tribe of Levi from Abijah and Aaron. Uh, You'll see these, just a little side reference, as priestly groups that are mentioned specifically in 1 Chronicles 23 and 24. So just a little extra history out there for you. Verse 8. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Hold your roll. So this is a lot bigger than I've seen a lot of people talk and discuss. As I was doing my research for this, I was reminded of some of this. And it's one of the things we kind of gloss over, but this is super important what he's doing. Zechariah has been given what is essentially this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to serve alone in this role at the temple. And it's something like he he probably would have been very proud of doing. Uh, From what I understand, there was actually a lot being done at the time where people were randomly selected for this job because they just had so many people who were capable of doing the role that it wasn't fair to just choose someone. So they did it, you know, through such a way as lots. But what this is for is Zechariah is offering incense before God so that he can pray over the entire nation. Just as it's done, this goes back all the way to Exodus. And I'll be reading specifically from the New King James Version for this one. This is Exodus 30, 7 through 8. Aaron shall burn on it, it being the altar of incense, sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So, while the temple was around, this was supposed to be done every single day, once in the morning, once at night. And this is for the people so that the priests would be praying specifically for them, reminding them not only of their roles, of what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to bring people closer to God and help them understand his laws, but to also show God's graciousness and that he allowed them to do this. And as we'll see later on throughout the Gospels, they're not doing this the way they should be, uh, most of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So it's nice to see someone actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. See verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. Uh, Excuse me. 
yet, yet troubled when he saw him, my bad, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. At uh, one of my old churches, uh, we used to have this saying that uh, when angels show up, people get pregnant. (laughs) Now, this is obviously not an entire one-to-one uh, it doesn't happen to Joshua when he meets the angel of the Lord right before Jericho. But a lot of the times uh, we see when an angel shows up, someone's getting pregnant. And this is an indicator of that. And it will happen later on in this chapter. So it just amuses me uh, just remembering that from a dear old time of my life. But what we see here is God doing the impossible yet again. Zechariah and Elizabeth are old. They have all but given up. I, I think Zechariah has given up. Elizabeth, maybe not, from what we can tell. But when the angel says that he is answering Zechariah's prayers, that we will eventually see that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And it just goes to show, like, we will pray for something for so long. And then when we don't get it, we give up. And then later on, if God chooses to give us to it, are we truly grateful for it because we've forgotten about it? Or do we have to relearn, oh, I should have kept praying for this and God gave it to me anyway. Or maybe he didn't. We don't know. Maybe it's because we gave up. Or maybe he's still merciful because he gave it to us even when we gave up. Zechariah has given up. And it's something we need to be mindful of as we approach God and ask him for what we desire in our lives. Another thing we see here is that angels also always inspire fear because as emissaries of God and representatives of his will, they kind of make us realize just how small and worthless we are, even though we are above them. Like, I mean, Paul writes later on, I can't remember when uh, he says so, but we are going to judge angels one day. Now, the context of that, who knows? Maybe the early church knew when we didn't. But the point of the matter is, God made the angels, and he made us, but we are shown favor over them. But they still represent him because these angels have not fallen, and we have. And as a testament of that, we should be fearful if we were to ever show up, and they would show up in our presence. Continue on to, excuse me, no, one more thing. And this reference to John not partaking of wine may be some type of Nazarite vow This is, of course, from Old Testament law. It's one of the things you weren't supposed to touch dead bodies or uh, drink wine, so on and so forth. We're not 100% on this. It's kind of given an indication that, yes, this is what he's supposed to do. But once again, it's not explicitly stated this is a Nazarite vow, but I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't bring it up. Which will bring us to verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done done for me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. A couple of things to bring up here. We learn, uh, well, first, let's get to Zechariah's response. I mentioned it earlier. He is unbelieving in this moment. It's not a question of logic. It's not a question of 
this is how the world works. It shouldn't be happening this way. This is him denying reality when spoken to him by a representative of God. And that is why he is punished for this, as opposed to something that will happen later on in this chapter, who responds in almost a similar way if we're just looking at the surface level. Does he deserve to be punished? Well, yes, he does. God is giving him what he asked for. And he's doing so in a way that will bless him immensely. So how dare anyone say, no, you don't get to tell me uh, about this God. You don't get to say this is going to happen. Or I wanted this seven years ago. You should have given it to me then. Like, how dare us? How dare he? How dare I? If I ever say that to him. And Gabriel, justly on behalf of God, renders him mute in this situation. Now let's get to Gabriel. Some of you may be unaware. Gabriel, this is not his first appearance in the Bible. He actually appears for the first time forever ago in Daniel, I believe in chapter 7 and 9, where he is there to help Daniel interpret some of the dreams he's had along the way. And Gabriel is one of the first angels who is given a name in the Bible, the other, of course, being Michael. And depending on your interpretation, Abaddon in Revelation, there's some debate. It is what it is. But Michael and Gabriel, for sure. And Gabriel is such an immense help as a messenger of God. And even in this moment of rebuke, he is giving Zechariah what he needs to be able to move on with his life. It's a very beautiful thing with what he's doing. And even after all this, the people, when Zechariah has to leave, they're expecting what he's supposed to do at the end of this is he's supposed to give you know, words of encouragement to the people, to speak to them, to you know, continue worshiping God, but he can't say anything. And this, need I remind you, is a, a time and a place where sign language does not exist in the form we have now. And this is a time and a place when especially uh, those who were less than, who were seen as disabled, were not given the same amenities we would be able to gift them with now. And it's one of those things I want to be a little careful about how I word some of these things because I have talked with people in uh, the community before uh, about how language is used against them. And uh, that would be the last thing I would ever want to do. So if I screwed anything up language wise, I apologize. Not my intent. But we do need to talk about the Greek word that is used to discuss, uh, uh, tell us what Gabriel does to Zechariah, and that is kophos. Now, that can either mean, depending on how you're translating it, either deaf or mute. In fact, though, it may serve both functions. As we later see in chapter 1, Zechariah is uh, seemingly unable to hear someone. So that may be a dual meaning there, and the, the word that Luke chooses to write is able to uh, signify that both are happening. Now, at the end here, we see Elizabeth like leaving for five months for some reason to keep herself hidden. Now, there's been some speculation about this. Um, most people, most scholars agree this was done for her so that she would be able to worship God in private and is not like an attempt to hide the pregnancy or the shame or something like that. This is her way of being uh, joyful and going to God in thanks for what he has delivered to her. And we'll pick back up in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be, will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, and there will be no end. In contrast to Zechariah, we see Mary's response right after this in the next verse in 34. She says, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? Or some your translations may say, I do not know a man. This is an honest question, not of doubt, but of not being able uh, 
to what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, it's a logical question born of confusion rather than Mary not being able to believe. Now, some people, uh, my more ultra conservative on the Protestant side would say, well, this is an example of Mary sinning. And that's proof that she is without sin. And excuse me, that she is with sin. And therefore uh, the Catholic teaching on her is completely wrong. And I agree with the Catholic teaching being wrong at all respects to my Catholic and Orthodox brethren out there. I do think Mary was born with sin, and I do think she sinned, and I do think eventually she got married and had kids with Joseph, but that's not what this is about right now. But I don't think this is it. This is her being flabbergasted. It was like, uh, uh, what, what do you mean? Uh, that's not possible, because it's not possible. But she asked it in a way right here that at, shows her faith in this moment. Well, how will this be? since I am a virgin. What Gabriel does after this will be immensely helpful. But before all this, we have a couple of things to discuss. One of the greatest parts of Luke, in my opinion, is that it seems one of his primary sources is Mary. Uh, a lot of scholarship has a dove into this subject. It seems that we get a lot from her that we don't get from the other Gospels. And one of the reasons they speculate is because he got it directly from her. If this is true, which I really hope it is, I love it because it just shows how thorough Luke is, but also shows Mary's faith years after the event that she remembers these things so clearly. And it's wonderful. Just one of the most, the most important part of her life at this moment and how she handles it. It's just a very gracious, wonderful uh, story told from her perspective. Now, another thing we need to discuss is uh, one of the reasons Mary is confused about this is due to how Jewish marriages were handled at that time. And obviously she would have kept herself pure for Joseph. And the reason she's, one of the reasons she's so flabbergasted is that it's split up in three ways, this whole Jewish engagement thing. You have the initial engagement, which is where they kind of have this formal agreement where both the, the dads of the groom and the bride be like, okay, this is happening. Next up, you'd have the actual betrothal. So you'd have a sharing of vows, but this would not be the actual wedding, which is weird, but you know what? Different cultures, different times. Then later on, a year later, more than likely, you would have the actual wedding. So it seems at this point in time, they at least had gotten to the second step, maybe the first only, so her confusion is perfectly natural in this moment. Another thing I would like you to notice is how Jesus is referred to here. He is called the Son of God. He is not literally created as the Son of God. Jesus was there with the Father from the very beginning. That's some Trinity talk I know in the episode zero. I wouldn't get too much into that. But to just ease you in that concept, as some people would try to claim, Jesus is not a created being. He existed before, he existed during, he existed after. Because he's always been, and always will, always will be. This is how it works. Verse 35. All right. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived the Son, and this is the sixth month with her who is and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We don't get a lot of angels speaking in Scripture. But I'm very glad that we could get this from Gabriel because it shows his compassion for Mary in this moment. And I'll get to what I mean by that. Uh, later on in the next couple of verses, but also shows his authority. Speaking for God is uh, something that we should all be in awe of. And beyond that, Mary's response is the most important part here. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. How many people do you know? Would even you or I? Be willing in this circumstance to say exactly what she said in 
humbleness and submission and love and faith. Let it be to me according to your word. I got to tell you, I'm not always there. And it's something I struggled with for a while is being willing to submit when I'm told, do this. But we do see Mary showing this in a way that is so beautiful and something that we should all learn from. We'll continue on to verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This right here is just, I, I keep using the word beautiful, but I do mean it. It's a very beautiful moment between two people who are there to help affirm one another in this moment, in this very trying circumstance. And I mentioned before why how Gabriel showed compassion on Mary. This is how. By telling her about what Elizabeth was going through, Gabriel gave her the only other person in the world who could possibly attempt to understand her situation. Not only was it family, but it was someone that she could place her trust in, someone she could talk to. And that is a wonderful thing, just shows the glory and majesty of God's power that he would allow this moment to happen to bring peace to someone who's obviously going to be troubled, even in her faith, by this news. But the best part of this, other than that, would be their affirmations of each other. Elizabeth doesn't get prideful. She doesn't say, I'm special because I was given a child that should never have been born. It's biologically impossible for me at my old age to have conceived. She sees what's more important here. When John leaps in her womb excitedly, she does the same at the same time to show her faith, to show her resolve and love for her cousin. Because even though she has been blessed immensely, a greater blessing has been sent to the world through Mary having the Savior come from her. And that's another thing we all get too bogged down with, is it's a good thing when God blesses us. It is bad when we then take that blessing and then say, look how God is good God is to me. I am so much better than you. We may not say that last part, at least out loud, when we're thinking it some of the time. And that is a very dangerous place to be because God can easily take whatever he has given away. And we should never take that for granted. Mary and Elizabeth don't, and we should learn from their example. Verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months and returned to her home. This is often called the Magnificat. Magnificat. This honest depiction of a young woman. We don't know how old Mary was. Some people believe she may have been as young as 14. Uh, different times, unfortunately. But it's just how it was. Uh, no one knows is the point. But either way, it doesn't matter how old she is. What matters is something is happening to her that's happened to no other woman. It will happen to no other woman ever again in the history of the world. And how does she respond? With joy and thanksgiving. Sending it directly to God, showing 
her faith in this moment. Not only that, but in the, a way shows how much she's been paying attention at the synagogue because this prayer reflects, uh, not word for word, but closely to a prayer that Hannah gives when she learns of Samuel uh, being born to her. And it's not like that's uh, a very that's from like, uh, obscure part of scripture, but for a, a girl her age, to remember that, and remember this is an age where you're they're reading off of scrolls, and you probably don't have this, especially as a a no uh, no money no nothing family just living in the outskirts of Nazareth. She paid attention to her scripture to where she could quote stuff like this. And why can't we do the same? I'll tell you why I can't, <laughs> because my memory sucks. <laughs> But uh, part of it also is I don't spend as much time as I should uh, reflecting on scripture. I will just blaze through reading something. Okay, my goal is to read four chapters of Amos today, what have you. All right, one, two, three, four, I'm done. Well, what did I read? I remember in the moment you asked me, Christian, what happened in chapter seven of Amos? I go, uh, I don't know. I say this as a calling out, not only of myself, but us as well. Let's pay attention to the good stories, the good history, the good songs written in this book, not just so we can recite them off to sound like we're clever, but so that we can remember the promises that God has made. And when they happen to us too, rejoice with those in the past who were given similar things to us. Like Mary does here in her like spiritual moment here, she's sharing that years later with Hannah. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. There I go using the word beautiful again. <laughs> Verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came the circumcised child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. Excuse me. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, Blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. A lot of great things happening here. Uh, one really bad thing, that of course being uh, the woman's <laughs> the woman's side is not trusted by everyone else because uh, it's just throughout history not taken as seriously as a man. It's just what it is. And when Elizabeth tries to give a name to her son, they go, oh, "Well, they give a flimsy reason. Well, that's not part of your family name." But that they expect Zechariah, being the man, to actually give the name of the child instead of it being some dual. A sense of we both agree on this name. But that is then given by Zechariah in a moment of tremendous faith where he writes it out and affirms Gabriel's message. Uh, this was typically used, uh, from what I understand, he would have been given a little uh, plate, a stone plate or some kind with, or maybe even wooden with some wax on it, and he was able to write using that. Don't know, have not seen a representation of this. But he's able to write, his name is John. And we see that he's kind of signing at them again, like not understanding what they're saying, potentially because he's deaf as well as mute. Kind of hard to tell. Can't really make a claim on it either way. But when he steps out in faith, affirming Gabriel's message, he is rewarded for his faith by the regifting of his voice and potentially his ears as well, his his hearing. And what does he do with what he does? He blessed God. Now, it's going to be a long time, a very long time before we're able to get into Job. But it's something we need to be reminded of there, is how we respond to adversity. No one likes reading Job. No one likes reading through that part. And if you do, you're weird. And I'm one of those people, so we're weird mutually. Job is a beautiful book. 
I'm so self-conscious about using the word beautiful. <laughs> but it is. It's a stellar story of God's faithfulness in the midst of crises, uh, in the midst of terrible things happening to people. And Job responds by blessing God after he's lost everything except for his wife and his friends. And they're not much of a good friends at that. Zechariah, who has lost less, responds in the same fashion. You and I, when we are suffering, how do we respond? Because if you're anything like me, complaining is one of my favorite things to do. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to go wrong. Well, of course this happened. Just as we were about to have fun. (laughs) I'll give a perfect example of this, a little sillier one. Uh, at the dorm room I've been living in, I, I have been had the immense opportunity, as opposed to most of my other uh, friends here sharing the dorm, to have a room that has a bathroom and has a shower bath. However, ever since I got here, it has always been cold water. And I've sent out maintenance requests after maintenance requests even though there are communal showers here and I use them and I'm grateful that they're there, it's still nice to have that there. But I finally, after break, after winter break, got back and someone had fixed it for real this time. And there's hot water in there. But I kept forgetting because I have an awful memory that it was there. So I would use it for a shower and then late in the night go, oh, well, I could take a bath, but oh, I've got to go to work or what have you. Finally got to use it. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. This, the heat, the aroma of uh, the water at that moment. It was chef kiss perfect. I got into the bath and the fire alarm went off. (laughs) (laughs) To say that I was angry uh, was, that's not put, that's putting it a little lightly. I was very upset. And I finally got what I wanted and I couldn't even enjoy it. And worse, I had to run around, put clothes on and step out just in case there was an actual fire. Of course, it was a drill. And then I complained, oh, it's a drill. But then I got back up. The water was still there. It was still hot. And I had that moment of, okay, I know what you're doing, God. And I'm sorry. I am grateful to have this. I apologize for how I've acted. Please forgive me. And it's a sillier thing, but I was still resentful. And that's something we need to be mindful of. No matter how small it is, we need to step out in faith and rejoice even when bad things are happening. So just some food for thought there. Next up, we'll go to verse 67 and we will finish the rest of this chapter. See, I told you we could do it. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance in Israel. We often forget how important this prophecy is because we don't have the context for what's going on here. The book of Malachi was written about 431, 430 BC, and then nothing. For over 400 years, we have no record of any credible text left behind by a prophet of God, uh, delivering his word to the people. Now, we don't know. There could have been a prophet in that time. It doesn't seem to have happened. And, of course, there are people out there, well, what about the first, second Maccabees, so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, I'm going to take that as apocryphal. 
There's a reason we in the Protestant faith see it as apocryphal. I think it's history written as if it which should be scripture. There are other parts of the apocrypha as well. That's for a far different discussion. But what we see here is that God has been silent and yet has not left his people to the point where 430 years later, he offers one of his servants the gift of prophecy, signaling that everything is going to change from this moment on. And that is immensely wonderful. For the people of Israel, this is hope that they have not had for so long, being under the oppression of Rome. They were a people that Maccabees had risen in rebellion and had taken control of the land back of Judah and had managed to reorganize the tribes, have their own nation. It, things were good again, but then corruption came up. They made bad alliances with people they shouldn't have. And Rome came and took them over, and now they're under someone else's control yet again. This right here, the birth of John and the eventual birth of Jesus, are going to give hope to people who have lost it a long time ago, to those who are willing to listen. And also we see, the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. It's a typical boy. He's outside all the time. But this is a tif different type. This is him learning what he's supposed to be later on as an atypical preacher in a time where all the quote-unquote good ones are going to be in their own houses, living in luxury, not working with the poor, not doing anything else, just lording themselves and their righteousness over other people. John the Baptist is going to do there and get in the dirt and do the work. That was Luke 1. I'm learning a lot of things as I continue on with this. How I want to do things, how I want to structure things better. Thank you for coming along with this experiment with me. This has been a ton of fun. There's so much more as I was going through this. Oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that. I'm always going to be the most critical of myself. I know the, the page flips came on the mic. It's going to be whatever it is. But once again, thank you so much for continuing this journey with Let Nothing Move You. Please, if you have the chance, leave us a five-star review on whatever uh, platform you're on. This should start on Spotify and Anchor, and I'm going to get it on Apple as soon as possible once I get the RSS feed going on. They really help us out. That's what they do, just to let people know that we exist. They're more likely to recommend us to other people. Really enjoy that. If you have any questions or you want to, want to just reach out to me, Contact us at let nothing move you podcast at gmail.com. And with all that in mind, God bless you all in accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you.